Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Nicomachean Ethics Book 8, in the course of discussing this, this broad topic of friendship, one of the issues that Aristotle is going to talk about is the relationships within what we can call the, the household, the oikos in, in Greek. Um, the, and this, this encompasses more than just the nuclear family, although what we nowadays call the nuclear family is really the core of it. It, it encompasses everything involved with being a, a landowner, a householder, um, somebody who has probably servants as well, who, who has the, the resources, the means to be able to engage in commerce with other people, to engage in social life. All of that is part of the, the household. And Aristotle thinks that some sort of friendship ought to be working within the household. We're going to talk about the role of affection in that in a separate video. Here what we want to look at is the relationship. What Aristotle sees is essentially a structural similarity between um, what goes on in the household, in the relations between the people, and what he calls political regimes, politeia. Um, these are also sometimes translated as constitutions. These are uh, broad ways in which we can classify societies, political communities, um, they're derived from some of the categories that, that Aristotle works out in some of his other books, like the politics. So I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time discussing this, this side just for its own sake. We can do that some other time when we're discussing the politics proper. But it is important to know a few things about Aristotle's conception of political regimes. You notice that we've got six of them up here, and they can be arranged in pairs that are actually opposites to each other. And there's greater opposition, Aristotle says, with these at the top of the list. Monarchy is very, very different than, than tyranny, although it does have one thing in common, quite literally one thing in common, one ruler. Um, democracy and democracy are a little bit closer together, and aristocracy and oligarchy are, are in sort of a middle state. They're, they're further apart than are these two, but they're not quite so far apart as are these two. So let's talk about what each of these mean. The other way in which we can understand this is, you know, instead of the oppositions, sort of this axis. And as we're going from the higher to the lower in this case, we're going from one person being in charge, one person determining, one person ruling, down to the many. Not, not everybody, but at least the many, those who are citizens, are able to engage in, in ruling. Perhaps not all at the same time. So monarchy, Aristotle says, is when one person rules, but it's not enough for one person to rule, because that's also the case in tyranny. What differentiates them, what separates this side apart from this side, is who is the rule exercised for? Is it carried out primarily just for the people on this side, the people in charge? Or is it something that is being done for the good of other people in the community, indeed of the community as a whole? So a real monarchy can only be a monarchy, in Aristotle's view, when power is being exercised not to retain power for the monarch, not to get everything you know, for the monarch and his cronies or household or anything like that, but for the entire community. If you stop doing that, you cease being a monarch, and you thereby become the worst of all things, which is to be a tyrant. 
A tyranny is a person, a tyranny is, I almost said a person, it's a person uh, corrupting the entire political regime or establishment or constitution and making everything turn on his or her will, uh, only for his or her benefit or for the benefit of those who he, is, he or she is closely connected with. Uh, it could also be for, you know, their um, class, their party, their, their race, their whatever we want to pick, some sort of division. But the, the key thing is one person is in charge. When we talk about dictatorships, dictatorships are typically tyrannies. If they're what we call an enlightened despotism, uh, and the person really, really is working for the good of everyone else, which uh, quite often is not the case, then that would be a monarchy, right? Now, if we, if we expand the, the number of rulers a bit more widely, and we have something like a class system, perhaps, then we have an aristocracy only when the people who are in charge are, in fact, the aristos, the, the best, the people who have virtue, and who are running the community and, and ruling it for the benefit of the other members of the community, not merely themselves. So it's not enough just to possess virtue, you also have to be exercising it. And Aristotle says that when that's not what's happening, when you have a few people ruling, not, not just one person, but you know, the ruling class, or uh, perhaps we, in our own time we might talk about a political class, right? Then you have an oligarchy, uh, which literally means rule by the few. Typically these are going to be the rich or the powerful um, who often coincide because if you have power you can quite often work the system to make some money out of it. If you have money you can usually work that to, to, to you know, uh, get something out of it, uh, to get some power. And the oligarchs are not interested in the good of the community as such. They're interested in their good. They're interested in perhaps the good of those who benefit them, but they're not interested in the other members of the community. And so that, that's a problem. That, these are what we call corrupted regimes as opposed to good regimes. Democracy and democracy. Now we tend to think of democracy in, in the West as being a good thing. It can't be democratic enough. Aristotle doesn't see democracy in itself as a good thing. He wants to qualify that. If we're just talking about mob rule, that actually often turns back into a tyranny. That's not a good thing. Uh, American Idol, not an example of a great way to run a society, right? Um, popular vote can be quite good if the people are actually well informed, if there are certain limits in place, and that is much more like what he calls a timocracy. In a timocracy, it's not anything goes so long as the people decide. Again, the uh, difference between them is going to be in a timocracy, the rulers are many, but the many are deciding on the basis of what's good for the entire community, not just themselves, not just their own class, whether it be the middle class, the lower class, uh, you know, not just their own group, not just even perhaps their own country, if we want to think about this in an enlightened way, uh, although Aristotle doesn't, doesn't really concern himself with that. In a democracy, the people who are in charge are doing it for their group. And this is why we, we often get party politics and faction involved in democracies. That shouldn't be the case quite so much in a timocracy. So we have now these, these six different regimes, right? How does that play out in terms of the family? Well, Aristotle tells us quite a bit about this. There's a father-son relationship. Um, I think in our own time we might say parent-sibling. Uh, you, you realize that Aristotle is, of course, uh, rather sexist in, in some of the things that he's saying here, particularly about husbands and wife. Um, but, you know, just trying to see, see past that to, to what we're getting at here. He talks about the relationship between husband and wife, spousal relations, and then he talks about the relationships between siblings. He talks in terms of brothers. I don't see any reason why we couldn't expand this to talk about other siblings as well. And you notice that each one of them corresponds to one of the good regimes, which means that one, you know, there, there's a principle of rulership, who is actually in charge, and how is power exercised, and for whose benefit is it being exercised. So let, let's take a look at what he actually says about these. He says we can find likenesses 
that is uh, homo homoeomata, right? And similarities and models, paradigmata, uh, in the household to the, these regimes. And he says, the relationship of father to sons is monarchical, monarchical, uh, regal. Uh, the father is essentially like a king. Father's first care is for his ch children's welfare. That's a good father, right? Uh, and he says this is why people call Zeus the, the father, for the ideal of kingship is paternal government. Then Aristotle makes a contrast, and he says, not everybody's like that. <clears throat> Here is where we might think about you know, how this would apply to our own time. If it's possible for a parent to be a monarch in respect to their children, that's only the case when the parent is actually doing things for the benefit of the children. It may not be recognized by the children as such, but the monarch, in order to be a monarch, actually has to be a good person and he has to be exercising power for the benefit of the entire household. If they're not doing that, then they are actually a tyrant. And remember, that is the worst of regimes. Aristotle is by implication saying parents who exercise tyrannical power over their children are the worst people in the household and they make the household into the worst kind of regime. Who does he talk about? He says, the Persians. Among the Persians, paternal rule is tyrannical, for the Persians use their sons as slaves. This is a, a fundamental problem. The Aristotle, of course, you know, doesn't uh, criticize the, the, the institution of slavery in any comprehensive way. He says that in many cases, uh, slavery is unjust, and you know, the wrong people are slaves and the wrong people are masters. But he does hold out some uh, possibility for you know, some power relations that are of a despotic, a slave to, to master kind of, kind of way. Um, that is inappropriate within the household for the relationship between parents and children. Really, parents and anybody, parents, you know, the two parents together, should not be despotic. Brothers uh, with, with brothers should not be despotic. Um, Aristotle doesn't worry about whether, you know, what about the servants? Uh, should it be despotic in relation to them? But we could, in fact, uh, discuss this further and extend that. But we're not going to do that here. What about husband and wife, spouses? He says, the relationship of husband and wife seems to be in the nature of an aristocracy. The husband rules in virtue of fitness, being fit to rule, and so in matters that belong to a man's sphere. Matters suited to a woman, he hands over to his wife. Now, you've got to read a little bit in between the lines, because when it comes to the household, what does that actually mean? The wife in Athenian society actually runs most of the household. The man doesn't do that much. The woman actually the one who's in charge, governs much of it. But he is ultimately in charge, so he's delegating, you could say. <clears throat> and this is Aristotle's sort of idealized view of gender relations. Like I said, we might want to you know, uh, bear this in mind and criticize it. It could be the case, though, that in, in some partnerships um, that we, we currently have today, that might actually be a good thing. One partner uh, handles the long-term finances, the other person handles the day-to-day -day budgeting, right? There are all sorts of splits like that. Now, what does Aristotle say about how this can go wrong? He says, when the husband controls everything, he transforms the relationship into an oligarchy, for he governs in violation of fitness, not in virtue of superiority. The idea behind an aristocracy is that <clears throat> people should do what it is that they're best suited to, and then the other person should listen to them. But they should do it in such a way as it's for the benefit of, of everybody involved. So if, if one person is better with handling the kids and discipline and the constant you know, nonsense that goes along with children, whether it be the husband or the wife, that person ought to be in charge of it. When one person arrogates to themselves everything and says, I'm the one who's in charge, uh, Aristotle says that's a corruption of this. That, that's a problem within the household. Um, going on a little bit further, he talks about brothers. And he says, um, 
Oh, there's, there's one other thing that he talks about. Sometimes when the wife is an heiress, it's, it's she who rules. In this case, authority goes not by virtue, but by wealth and power, as in an oligarchy. So, um, we, again, we might extend that to thinking in terms of, of both parties. There's an old expression, when you marry money, you earn it. So when you're marrying into an unequal relationship, power might be exercised in that way. Going back to, to brothers, so um, brothers, he says, uh, they ought to be in a sort of democracy. They are equals, but they're not completely equals. Insofar as they differ in age, there's a little bit of inequality there. So he says, if the difference in age be great, the friendship between them cannot be of the, the fraternal type. And then he says, where do we see democracy? Democracy appears most fully in households without a master, without anybody in charge. For in them, all the members are equal, but it also prevails where the ruler of the house is weak, and everyone is allowed to do what he likes. And, you know, that doesn't sound so bad, right? But if you think about what's required to hold a household together, think about, um, we're not even going to worry about money at this point. Just think about scheduling all the different activities. You've got a you know, husband, wife, kids, uh, you know, the dog, and, and, you know, who knows what else, neighbors and all that. Scheduling. Who decides when things are going to happen? Who settles scheduling conflicts? Does everybody just throw whatever they want onto the calendar and say, me, 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 me? Well, that would be an example of democracy. The, the many rule, the many get a lot of freedom, uh, but it doesn't turn out that well for everybody. And it, it tends to you know, uh, give, give way eventually to somebody saying, that's it, I'm laying down the law right now, I'm going to be the tyrant. So why is all of this important in terms of friendship? Aristotle says that both in the political community and in the household, friendship has a alignment, let's call it, with justice. And all of this is a matter of justice, what's right and what's wrong, who, who owes what to who, who should be exercising power, for what reason, to what extent. Same thing applies over here. So Aristotle thinks that it can be helpful to look at these pol political regimes to understand how things ought to be working and where things go wrong within the household, or as we call it these days, the family. 